Good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us for a great webinar this evening. We've got some great hosts with us, some great partners. And I hope you've all had a great day. It's snowing in Erie, Pennsylvania. That's April weather for us. So our topic for tonight is adapt and move into the future of dental sleep medicine. I want to thank you for our three partners this evening. Mr. Ryan Jobenbach, the president and CEO of sleeptest.com, and Mr. Randy Kern, the founder of Pristine Medical Billing, and Dr. Singh. Excuse me, you can see his credentials here. He's quite accomplished, and important thing for all of us is he's board certified in sleep medicine. So our learning objectives for this evening, new topic for some of us, for others, it's been known for quite some time as Dr. Singh will enlighten us, home sleep testing, medical billing, and therapy. The reason that we've picked this topic is when I posted on LinkedIn to give us some ideas for some webinars that you would like to hear, the one, number one recommendation was telemedicine. And I reached out to Randy and Ryan and asked for their input. And they asked Dr. Singh to join us. And that's why we're here this evening. We're all in some very unique situations that most of us have never encountered with our dental practices. And I think we're all in the same boat that we're not seeing a lot of patients. In Pennsylvania, we're limited to urgent and emergency care. Um, the first week, the PA Department of Health shut us completely down. So that's when I talked to Randy about telemedicine. And um, he gave me some tips that he's gonna share with us today. And I will tell you this, yesterday I saw six patients via telemedicine and it was an incredible experience. I saw six of the patients via doxy.me that Randy will talk about tonight. And at the end of the calls, I asked patients to rate their experience, zero to 10, 10 obviously being the best. Five of the six gave, us ten, it gave me a 10. The one gentleman gave me a nine and he said, let me tell you why I gave you a nine. I said, great, I'd love to hear why. He said, I miss seeing Tammy. I was like, well, it's great that you miss seeing Tammy. So do I, Tammy is my assistant for those of you that have uh, encountered her on some of our webinars and live. So very interesting, very positive feedback. Next week, I'm doing six live consults for the initial uh, consultations for sleep patients. Uh, because seeing a sleep patient is not considered urgent for emergency care. So it's a way for me to keep my sleep practice going. So really exciting times. Hope you enjoy our program. Um, I'd like to go over a few guidelines for tonight's program. The webinar is being recorded and you all get a link to the presentation. For those of you that would like CE, please email your request to a Simon at tuckereducationalexcellence.com, as you can see on your screen. If you're an AGD member, please include your AGD number when you send the email to my business partner, Mr. Al Simon, and he will get that for you appropriately. One thing, please. I ask all of you, we have a lot of attendees on this evening. If you would please hold all your questions until the Q&A section at the end of the presentation, that will be really helpful. So let's get started. So this is gonna be an exciting night. I recommend that you grab a big cup of coffee or an adult beverage of your choice. 
because we have a jam-packed night. So our first presenter, I'm gonna switch screens and give it over to Mr. Ryan Jovenbach. As soon as I can find you here, Ryan. Ryan, you got it? Yes, sir. I was just letting you wrap up there, Tucker. Thank you very Thank much. You, can you see my screen okay? Can you hear me okay? We can see you, but I cannot see your screen. Okay. One second. Okay, I'm sharing. Are you sure? Yeah, hang on. It's, uh, hang on a second. Hey, Tucker, I can see it. Can, can you? you? See it? Okay. Yep. Perfect. Huh. Well, then we'll go with that, yeah. Tucker. It's okay. You, you can be the great monitor, moderator, orator, everything else. Um, so great. first and foremost, thank you, gentlemen, for. Uh, letting me be a part of this. And those of you guys that are here, thank you for making time, whether that's away from your families, away from quarantine, whatever that might be. And, um, you know, obviously there, there are some conversations here that we've been having about adapting and moving into this space. But what I, what I really want to say is, is now is the time to flip our perceptions. And for those of you guys who've heard me speak before, sorry, not sorry. I bring a lot of psychology, human behavior into this. And I'll share some of my sort of grieving process through all this too, uh, because I want to share that vulnerably. And, and I picked this slide specifically here and found the word togetherness. A lot of what I've been reading, a lot of what I've been seeing out there um, is all about doing this together. And don't get me wrong, there are some people who, you know, are trying to stay as far away from people as possible. But in this purpose, in this mission, we've got something to do. And I'm hoping that you guys get a little bit out of this and you start turning your trials into triumphs because we can only sit around for so long and not what do what we do the best or not do what we love to do the most, which is really serve others. So I don't care if you're an, a doctor, an assistant, a business owner, or maybe you're all of the above. You know, our purpose here, not only on this call, but every time I get on a call with Dr. Singh, Dr. Tucker, you name it, the whole thing that we're trying to do here is minimize the barriers to testing so we can increase access to care. And look, we don't get to be the ones to change or save lives, but you do. And so uh, for those of you guys who have seen this before, I, I think it's really important that we get grounded and uh, really think about why we do what we do. And I always get these fantastic articles from Tucker, um, so thank you for sharing. Um, but looking at this ATS piece here, I, there's a word that kept popping out of me that I keep hearing other people talk about during these times. So we know that we need good quality sleep. And we know while people are stressed out, overwhelmed, bored, whatever that might be, now is a fantastic time to be able to help them with their sleep. If we're motivated to get off of our tails and help them do it, we know the long-term consequences of impaired quality life, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, depression, cancer, you name it, that's specifically quoted from this article. And I'll show you the, the word that keeps popping out of me here, other than impaired quality life and mortality, uh, was depression. And, uh, you know, Dr. Singh and I were talking about this the other day with regards to some of our referral forms. and. Here in California, it should not be raining right now, but it's been raining for a week straight, and that doesn't help, I can tell you that. But everything about this piece talks about poor quality sleep, short-term sleep, and the link to depression, depression, depression. And I think we have a really good opportunity to potentially help those patients that are out there, sitting at home, trapped at home, maybe lost their jobs, whatever it might be, um, because if we don't, who's going to? 
And I'm going to keep on talking about that because well, we've all seen these slides too. All the direct problems and consequences. And whether your state says you can do A, B, or C, or you can't do A, B, or C, um, I'll tell you, we at sleeptest.com have a very small, narrow window to be able to do what we do because we provide a better night's sleep that's directly linked to sleep apnea, which could potentially kill someone in their sleep. And we're all sitting here thinking about obstacles, and I can tell you it was Friday the 13th. And Friday the 13th is, is usually a fantastic day for me. It's one of my favorite days because that was one of the days I asked my wife to marry me, and she actually said yes. Um, so every Friday the 13th has been amazing for me for almost 12 years until March 13th. Found myself in a struggle, uh, realizing, you know, I've, I've got to make some serious decisions. And I went home to my office that night at my home office and just sort of closed the door with the kids knocking on the door and everything else. I'm like, what am I going to do? I need to lay off some of these folks, furlough those folks. And I, I've got to, I was playing defense for two weeks until Mr. Randy Kern calls me and gives me the William Wallace speech of a lifetime and says, dude, now is the time we got to move. And it, it really took some time to think about what these obstacles are, recognize them, acknowledge them, but also <laughs> look to one of my favorite books I've ever read. And if you were at the NADSM, thanks again, Jason Tierney, Guy, and everybody else who brought one of my favorite authors to the stage, Ryan Holiday with The Obstacle is the Way. And one of the first quotes in that book by Marcus Aurelius says, the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. But when we first see that obstacle, when we first run into it, when we first hit that rock-solid brick wall, what do I do? I back up. I get scared. I get fear fearful. I, I have anxiety. And it takes me a second to really think about the fact that I have a choice to either stand up and do something about it or sit back and do nothing. While, like you, I have a family to feed, I have a business with team members that I love and care for, I've got a home with a mortgage, two offices with leases. So I have a choice, and I think you all have a choice as well. So I'd like you to think about what did it feel like the first couple of days of the first few weeks? And think about where is where was the turning point for you to stand up and do something? And if you haven't had it yet, I hope it's today. And if it's not today, I hope it's tomorrow. And if it's not after that, then give me a call directly. You guys can all have my direct number, cell phone number, because I'm in this with you. We're in this with you. And I think the number one thing we have to do is simply accept it, acknowledge where we are. But after that, sometimes the hardest thing is to take the first or next best step. Okay, we all have some great opportunities with SBA and PPP, um, but I want to go a little bit deeper. What what can you do in your practice? And Randy and our, I have already put together some pieces for you, so anybody who reaches back out to us will give you the content for email blasts. But first and foremost, look into a simple telemedicine application that you can use. Um, we're talking a lot about doxy.me because a lot of our physicians use it. Uh, my my father-in-law's vascular surgeon used it last week and it was simple, um, didn't cost him a thing. So again, we're going to talk more and more about this because uh, we're, Randy and I are both getting a lot of calls from our clients and I know Tucker, you are too. What do I do? How do I do this? So from there, and again, I, I'll set up a plan with you. But I think it would help to get at least some kind of email blast or mailer together. Get it out to your patients. Let them know you have technology that you can use to connect with them. Um, I like Constant Contact and Mad Mimi. I know a lot of your software that you use in dentistry and in medicine have that uh, feature as well. Um, but immediately connect with the patients who reply right away. And when I say start this letter, write this letter, get this email blast. I I'm talking tomorrow, guys. And uh, Steve Carsonson and I were having this call uh, a week and a half ago, um, thinking about just going through a list of patients. You know, look at the, the low-hanging fruit. Who are the patients that you screened before this all happened? Who's ready for testing? 
you know, from there, who are those other patients? Maybe, you know, get with one of your team members. Get on the phone, use Zoom, use this doxy, connect with them and find out who are those other patients that you have some concerns with. You know, pick up the phone, make some personal calls. The one thing I love about dentistry, and I've worked with everybody from interventional cardiology to sleep physicians to interventional radiology, et cetera, dentists are my favorite to work with because you guys have rapport with your patients and they love you. I see you twice a year and I, I love a call from my dentist. And so I've heard a lot of friends uh, on my end, too, saying, man, you must be blowing up right now because there's no other time to get your sleep tested than now. What, what else are you going to do? So, again, if you need help with that, everybody here is going to have my contact information at the end. I will plan a 30-minute or an hour call with you next week, set up a plan of attack, and do something. But first, you have to choose, and choosing is a piece we can't help you with. But what we can help you with is what to do right now, how to do it, and we're going to show you how we can help. So because of this whole thing, we've had to pivot. We've had to look at the obstacle and use it as an opportunity. And so as many of you guys know, and I do not want this to be a sales pitch, forgive me, but I need to show you what we've done to help you connect with your patients while also creating a 100% compliant piece, whether it's now with COVID, or in the future to accommodate for AADSM, AASM, state dental boards in Ohio, New York, New Jersey, uh, of course, Georgia too. So with our service, assuming you connect with your patients, obviously the home sleep test in the comfort of their own bed, we are now doing pre and post test telemedicine visits. We'll manage the operations. Guys, talking about obstacles. I have two locations. My goal is to get everybody home so they're safe with their friends and family. And I've redirected all of our home sleep testing devices to California. And again, just sharing openly business owner to business owner. I am a part of all sanitation. I see every device that comes in. I see every device that goes out. Spiritually and ethically, I will not be a part for any way, shape, or form of spreading this any further, but really connecting with patients, getting them the good night's sleep that they need. So I know we have a lot of clients on this call and a lot of new folks too. Essentially, this is how it works, and I'll break these down one by one. Number one, you can refer your patient in directly to us through an online HIPAA compliant portal. You will no longer have to worry about the liability because all these patients coming in are going to go through a telemedicine consult with a board certified sleep physician. But before that, we just need a quick call with them because we know dental patients. Dental patients want to know their out-of-pocket portion before they let you open their mouth, right? Medical patients, they don't care. But we're sort of straddling things here. So we'll do a quick call to go over their benefits. And I'll share something excited about that. I'm excited about, about that whole section. Um, they'll do that first telemedicine visit with a board-certified sleep physician in network. Okay, so the cost of this is essentially going to be their copay, and I know Randy's going to harp on this a little bit later, so I just want to plant the seed and let Randy bring it home. From there, we'll ship the device straight to their home, two-day ship time via USPS priority mail, two-night home sleep test in the comfort of the patient's own bed. But after that, we're going to do a follow-up telemedicine visit with you, with your patients. Why? Some carriers require this now, and at the same time, our physicians are completely on board with oral appliance therapy, and they will build the urgency with your patients to get them to move forward. And now that we have that whole step-by-step -step process, we can officially provide the prescription for oral appliance therapy along with the diagnosis, along with the letter of medical necessity that will be dental friendly. So a little icing on the cake here because I can't steal Mr. Randy Curran's fire here, but if you go through this process, just you, so you can see, again, on our end, I, I welcome you to use any medical bill you like. We, use, we work with a lot of them, whether it's four pillars, go-go billing. Uh, Pristine happens to be the one. This is Randy's idea three years ago to do this automated benefit check. Um, so within 48 hours of getting the sleep test results, you can also get the automated benefit check with the estimated insurance payment on behalf of the carrier the patient out-of-pocket portion, and they'll start the accelerated pre-op for you too. 
And so I'll leave the real nuts and bolts of that to Randy. Um, but for our shared clients, uh, Randy and his team have stepped this up from a leadership perspective um, because of COVID now, but also why not do this for the rest of our future? They will also physically do your patient consult for you regarding the financials. So again, ask Randy about that. He'll dive into it. The other piece here, we get this question all the time at sleeptest.com from our dental clients. I've got a severe patient. What do I do with them? I can't connect with a sleep physician. I don't have that entity. I don't have that rapport and relationship. Or, hey, we're in the current times, and we want to get that patient in therapy right away. Randy will tell you more about having a PAP delivered directly to their patient, your patient's home to suffice not only for severe patients or because you want to get them in therapy right now or because the medical carrier requires the trial prior to getting into oral appliance therapy. So stay tuned on more of that from Randy Curran. I think you're going to be really excited about that. Um, quick overview on the step-by-step -step process. It doesn't matter if you're a standard sleeptest.com client um, or if you're a DS3 user. This is the model with current sleeptest.com. Fill out the referral form, drag and drop it into our online automated portal. So no more faxing. Once you do this, everything becomes automated. Everything becomes electronic. We take it from there. We run with it. We do it for you. So from here, if I'm a DS3 user, screening your patients over the phone, screening them via telemed, whatever it is you're going to do, you can still order that referral directly through us, and we're going to triage the patient for the telemedicine visit. From here, one thing we've loved to be doing for, I think, two years now, uh, again, most of you guys know I'm not a doctor, I'm not a dentist, I'm not a physician. My love, my education, my passion are in psychology and human behavior. Even if you build urgency with the patient in the back office or from your telemedicine consult, if you don't set the proper next steps and gain commitment for that next step, they do nothing. So you can schedule that patient for their benefits analysis conversation with our team prior to telemedicine right here on our calendar. Right when you do this, the patient will get an automated email. They can add it to their calendar on their iPhone, their Android device, whatever it might be. And on top of that, it will send them an automated email 24 hours before that call and a text message 15 minutes before that call so they don't miss the call. Now, this is something I'm really excited about. Thank you to Randy. Thank you to Dr. Singh. Brand new. As many of you guys know who have been using us for some time, uh, we've been doing this from an out-of-network perspective. Randy calls this a puzzle. He's been working on it in his brain for eight years while, uh, I don't know, in, in sleep for 15, Randy. Correct me later, please. We can now look at your patient's data and navigate them in-network for their telemedicine visits or their HST. We can navigate them out of network. We can now test Medicare patients, or we can treat them as a private patient, which you guys, most, most of you already know, the most they're going to pay as a private patient is 285 for the diagnostic test and 185 for the follow-up titration test. So patients are prepped and ready to go. Um, we're going to go over this with your patient so you don't have to do it so they can understand if they're going to go in network, out of network, Medicare or private, and physically counsel them on their patient portion so we accommodate for the perception and the human behavior of a dental patient who has to know exactly what the cost is before they take the next step. So from there, we schedule the telemedicine visit. So pre-test telemed visit to accommodate for what's going on in today's world, but will accommodate for the AADSM, the AASM guidelines, as well as the state dental boards. So our physicians, will review not only the intake form with all the patient information, the medical data, the, the medical history, they'll screen the patient, build urgency, and they are the ones to refer the patient for a home sleep test. Just like before, patient gets the device straight to their home, two to three day shipping time. Uh, that's all included in their total cost. Two night sleep test in the patient's own bed. And guys, I wanna talk about this because I think there are a lot of great devices out there uh, whether they be two nights, one night, uh, more data, less data, disposable, uh, we are still actively and aggressively using the Apnea Link Air. Um, 
I think this is a fantastic device for two reasons. About 93% of our clients are dentists. This is one of the best devices in deciphering between central and obstructive apneas. And since we started this business three years ago, we have had 97% success with all of our testing as far as less than 3% patients have had to be retested. So the other thing that's important here is we have to have something that's completely simple and easy for the patient to complete. And so until we have further conversations about this with other folks, I welcome them. But in the meantime, we're very confident with what's going on here. And I want to bring this up because I think it's important. Everyone's talking about it. This is directly on our website. Thanks again, Steve, for the recommendation. My team put this up in 24 hours after you suggested it. Um, we are up to date every day with the CDC and the WHO. 14-point inspection and sanitation process that I am in. On top of that, the solutions that we've been using to sanitize our devices, we're on the list in with the CDC. Back on March 13th, they were there. So I'm extremely confident with that. The one thing I will tell you in effort to not only protect my team, but also protect your patients, when your devices or your patient's devices land here at our office, uh, we have a specific room that they go into that's completely filtered. Um, it, we've got this air filter filtration that is phenomenal, sort of uh, allowing and pulling any kind of particles that could still be there. But remember, it's a two to three day ship time as is. So no one's touched that home sleep test device for two to three days, lands at USPS. Our, my concern personally is just making sure that, uh, you know, there wasn't somebody at USPS that could be carrying something to bring it our direction to my team. So this is directly on our website. I'll just show it to you real quick so you can see um, right here. And it's, it's listed as a banner on the top. You can share that with your patients. Quick story about what we're doing. Uh, the list in from the CDC. Um, quick report on what we know as far as how long the COVID uh, virus can stay on specific services. And then we want to teach patients, too, what they should be doing. And finally, talk to, talk to them and be very open, very vulnerable, very uh, efficient with regards to why we're doing what we're doing with the delayed shipping. So usually our turnaround time to get results to a, a, a referring dentist is two to four days. Now I would expect anywhere between four to six days on purpose. Okay, so we're doing that for your safety, for your patient safety, and also for our team safety. Next, post-test telemed consult. And if I didn't say this earlier, guys, these are in-network telemed consults. Very low cost. Your patient can actually, if we do everything in-network, Randy will go into this, but I could do a pre-test telemed consult. I could do my baseline HST. I could do a follow-up post-test telemed consult and a titration test, probably for less than $200, all combined. So you have the protection, you have the advice, and you have our physicians building the urgency with your patients, and that officially allows us to provide not only the diagnosis, but the letter of medical necessity and the prescription, friends, that you've all been asking for for a long time, and that can be supplied either through the sleeptest.com portal or through DS3 that lands directly in your account. One thing that I think a lot of our clients love that we do different than anybody else. Again, it has to do with human behavior. It has to, be con it has to do with control. If I happen to be a con control freak, we'll notify you every step of the way where the patient is. Did the patient say yes or no? Did we ship out the device? Did we get it back? Do I have the results? So you don't have to log into DS3 every day and check to see if things are there or not. We over communicate with you in an automated fashion just by changing the status of the patient. And our goal is to simply keep you in the loop and give you options to be able to physically get to these patients now. But the problem is you have a choice. I made my choice two weeks ago. And my choice was to stand up and do something about this. The one thing that we can't physically teach you how to do tonight is how to find that choice or how to find the desire. You've got to dig deep and find out what's it going to be, the blue pill or the red pill. If you choose the right pill, we're here, we're happy to help you, and we're honored to serve along with you guys 
that we've got to get you motivated and you've got to be able to motivate your patients to do something too. So, Tucker, thank you for that opportunity there, sir. Um, friends, this is my all my contact information. That direct line goes straight to uh, my uh, not only my landline, but also rings to my cell phone if I'm not there. Um, and the one thing I did want to point out, other than most of you guys have seen my beautiful family, it's my wife, Selena, my son and daughter, Micah and Skyla, who, believe it or not, are on this webinar tonight. So, um, you know, we're trying to teach them what Zoom's all about. And uh, hope you guys are having a good night and being, being good for mommy. Um, last thing I'll say on this, too, uh, we are going to do a promotion for everybody here. You'll get a follow-up email about this. Um, where we're taking our cost down almost 50% for new clients. Um, but if anybody wants to schedule a demo with me specifically, you can actually do that straight from our website. So if you go to contact us right here, interested clinicians, schedule a free demo. So I will personally take those calls. I'll walk you through via webinar. I'll walk you through on a phone call. I will even spend the time to create a marketing plan to get you guys out there to get in front of your patients. So that's all I have for now. I'm going to share with the rest of these folks. But, uh, Tucker, did you want to uh, handle any Q&A now? Happy to do that if you'd like. Yeah, you know, we're, we're getting um, a bunch of questions in. And great presentation, Ryan. And you, as always, you did a fantastic job. And great to see Selena and the kids. And hey, Selena and the kids, glad you're on. <laughs> um, I think that... Uh, Randy, put this in your queue, please. Um, a lot of questions regarding telemedicine and Medicare being a face-to-face. -face. Um, Ryan, sleeptest.com available in Canada? Great question. Love that one. I think I, I heard somebody say the other night on one of the other webinars, uh, send me that information. Um, not yet, guys. Um, to be able to get all that across the border is a bit of a challenge. Um, but if anybody up there wants to have that conversation, I welcome it. And, um, you know, as of right now, sh long story short, not at the moment. So okay, it's here in the U.S. So another question. So the patient can do a pre and post sleep test consult, correct? That is, that is correct. Okay. Um, do you handle the post titration testing regarding the RX and the testing? Correct. Yes, we do. And I'll tell you, Dine. just to, to harp on that, Tucker, I know all your patients do a follow-up titration test somewhere between one to six months. Uh, friends, that, that's really important. I can't tell you how many patients that we, we test, we diagnose, and how few actually move forward with therapy. Uh, remember, there's a lot of placebo effect that could take place there. I'm fine. I feel good. My wife said I stopped, I'm stopped snoring. Um, you know, I'm going to the gym again. But we don't have true efficacy to say that we dropped their AHI, et cetera, by 50% or more. Um, I always use the analogy, forgive me if it goes too far out, um, but being in the vascular space, if, if a surgeon would place a, a stent or do an angioplasty in, in an artery or a vein, they don't just walk away. You go back in, you run fluoroscopy, you make sure you've got that full open uh, vessel so it's working. So that's what we want out of this therapy too. So in my opinion, I recommend you have that conversation in the front end of all of this. No later than the time that you delivered therapy because you don't want this to be a surprise. Great job. So let's uh, move on. Guy, thank you for your uh, great comments. Appreciate it. Um, question here that I guess I will take. How does the appliance get delivered? Um, do we tempt them? What's the end point? Um, once again, Ryan went through everything regarding sleep, uh, getting a sleep study done for our diagnosis. Um, I am in no way advocating um, delivering a uh, device to a patient uh, in any other form other than seeing them in the office for a personal face-to-face -face visit. I think there's that's too high risk. 
So I am not a big fan of provisional appliances. That's just one man's opinion, opinion, opinion. Um, Ryan, any advice or for texting out uh, information to patients to start screening? Will you be able to provide that? Great. So good question. Um, some of our system does text messaging as well. Um, whoever that might be, again, please, uh, I guess I'll go back to the slide here too. Let me uh, try to figure that out. Why is it not going back? My contact information is here, friends. So whoever that was, email me. What I want to put out there is let's set up a game plan on how to contact those patients. I don't care if it's email, letter, text message. If I were you, I would do all of the above. Um, you know, I know not all of you have been through excessive training in sales or have sales experience in a, in a corporate setting. Forgive me, I know we are all selling something at some point. But um, it, it's a numbers game, guys. And what you have to find is what's going to work best for you, what's easy for you and your team. But what are your patients going to gravitate toward? And, and what are they willing to respond to? And so we use a lot of text messaging on our end, and I would highly recommend it. It's just going to be less material, a less content that you can put in there. I like an email blast and follow it up with a text message because in the email blast, you could put your calendar and have them schedule on your calendar. Um, I use a tool called Calendly for all of my scheduling. So anybody at any time can go to my email signature, basically just click a button and schedule on my calendar. So if you had that link inside one of those email blasts, they could physically schedule that time with you right there on their cell phone, but from an email. So whoever that was, I'd, I'd love to chat with you about it. I think it's just taking larger material from a letter or an email and condensing it, less is more. Great. So to summarize, Ryan, you're going to be able to assist with that, correct? You got it, sir. All right. Next question. Um, can the medical doctor work throughout all states, which also ties into if we are in North Carolina, can we get in network approval? And Randy, that you might want to put that in your queue. Um, so if I could answer the question about telemed sure. or HST. Uh, in network, yes, we can do that in all 50 states. Okay, but as great. far as you being the dentist, that's a different story that is a long, drawn-out process that I know Randy and Pristine, uh, their team, are doing for clients. Um, but it's something that uh, we can help. Our whole goal right now, our mission, is to essentially, and I'll let Randy get into it, but the goal is to make every step the most affordable that it can possibly be for patients. But we might look at a benefit check and say, hey, this could be more affordable, not only to go out of network for the HST, but I could help with the follow-up because we're also looking at what would the cost be for that patient on the back end for oral appliance therapy. So I know Randy's going to talk about that, so I don't want to take it away from him. Great. So the question is, can you do a follow-up sleep study for someone who already has an appliance? Absolutely. Great. Would love to. Of course. Um, here's a doctor. How are we taking the impression? Doctor, I would refer you back to um, some of the previous webinars that I've done. Um, unfortunately, tonight's presentation is uh, not on technique of bite registration or impressions, but great question. Thank you so much. Another uh, question about what appliance to give a patient uh, without seeing if they have limited range of motion, limited lateral movement, et cetera. Uh, fantastic question. Once again, one man's opinion, opinion, opinion. I am not in favor of just sending a patient an appliance um, via mail um, or FedEx or whatever delivery method uh, is presented. I think the patient needs to be seen in person. And of course, before I see the patient and deliver them my appliance, I want to know that I have a diagnosis because we all know we don't treat the patient unless we have a diagnosis from a board certified sleep physician. So good job, my friend. I say that, um, we move forward, and by all means, we can take more questions. Oh, boy, there's tons of them coming in right now. Um, 
Well, why don't so, we why don't we do this? Because I don't want to so take why, up what, all the yeah, time. Yeah, why don't why, why don't we get to Dr. Singh? So yeah. if you if you would please do the honors of introducing Dr. Singh and reviewing his credentials some with us, um, that would be great. I will. And right now, guys, I'm going to go ahead and hide my webcam. Uh, yeah, we're still sharing your webcam. Okay, well, hang on a second. Uh, stop sharing my webcam. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing mine. But if Dr. Singh, if you're able to share yours, I'll uh, embarrass you a little bit and talk about you here for a few moments and why we created this uh, alignment to help more patients. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm on already, yep. You know, it's interesting. I can't see, but um, I do have a handsome picture of your face there, and if it's not right now, uh, I, I don't know, it Tucker, looks, can you see? It, it looks great, Ryan. So if you want awesome. to go, I think if you just uh, close out your keynote um, and make sure your go to meeting is open, you should be able to see the slide. Okay. Well, I'm going oh, to make go. sure my slide, my slide's still going. All right. Well, we see you, and we haven't changed presenters. Okay. Well, I do have to share the slides. So I've got, I have Dr. Dr. Singh's slides. Correct. Okay. So why don't I go ahead and do that, and we'll we'll go from there. Um, Great. So I'm really pr privileged uh, to have the opportunity to work with Dr. Singh. Um, First and foremost, like we were all talking about earlier, one thing that I know you all are interested in and excited about is, is working with board-certified sleep physicians. So not only is he board-certified in sleep medicine, but also in psychiatry. Uh, he did his fellowship where he was the chief fellow in sleep medicine at the University of Texas South Southwestern. Also did his general psychiatry, a psychiatry residency at the John Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore. Uh, he's the president and CEO of Sleep Medicine Specialist California, as well as I Sleep Physicians Group, um, the medical director of the Tri Valley Sleep Center. And he's one of our leaders on our team, giving us advice, what to do, what not to do, how to do this, why would I do it better, how can we manipulate things, and gosh darn it, why aren't you using telemedicine yet? <laughs> so Dr. Singh's been using telemedicine for years. Um, makes it really easy. The first time I ever got on a telemedicine consult with him, I kind of stopped and thought, is that it? Do I do anything else? And the beautiful thing about not only our model, but what he's using is that you don't have to own and operate a telemedicine model. Um, I have a lot of respect for some of our friendly competitors out there that have developed some great technology. Um, but what we've learned on our end, whether it was with devices, shipping and receiving. Our goal was to be servants and to be able to serve you guys from A to Z. And so Dr. Singh has also been working with dentists for 12 years. Um, he believes not only in the oral appliances, he believes in uh, orthodontics, he believes in myofunctional therapy, and um, he's been recommending that for a long time. And one thing I've learned about him as well that uh, he may not share with you he loves playing hoops, and he says, it's my thing. So him and his son are playing hoops quite often. And uh, I remember the last time we were going to get on a, a teleconference, he said, well, Ryan, I, I, I'm just playing hoops with my son. Can I <laughs> uh, maybe skip on the, the video cam? So Dr. Singh's going to tell us a little bit about his experience with telemedicine and also his love and respect for oral appliance therapy, which will be the next slide there, Dr. Singh. So I'm going to go on mute, but please. Number one, thank you for being here. Thank you for bringing these ideas to our attention. And thank you for partnering with us to make sure that we bring something valuable to all of our clients across the country. Thank you so much, Ryan, for the introduction. And uh, you're definitely right. I'm a hoops guy. <laughs> so over uh, over uh, over what I do in my office, uh, hoops takes precedence. But nowadays, we can't do much of that. So <laughs> um but thanks for the introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity. I want to thank uh, Dr. Tucker, Ryan, and Randy for this opportunity because we do have an opportunity at this time that's quite unique and that can make really make sort of a big 
difference in terms of practicing medicine, practicing dentistry, and really bringing the best care to patients um, that we know that works and has been out there for a long time. You know, I, I wanted to say that I've been working with uh, Randy and Ryan now for a few years, uh, and, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why we all came together is that I actually really appreciate their level of attention to detail, uh, their level of really understanding the industry, you know, understanding patient care, their motivation for patient care, and really making it easier and more effective for patients to get appropriate treatment. So uh, kudos to you guys, really, because that's really it's the attracting factor to me is to work with all of you, you know, and, uh, and thanks to Dr. Tucker again for this uh, educational opportunity to bring it all together. Um, you know, but like Ryan said earlier, you know, we are really at a point in, in time which is unique, you know, where the obstacle really becomes the way. You know, fortunately for me, you know, I've been doing sleep medicine now for the last 12 years. And prior to that, I was practicing psychiatry. Um, but I really had a chance to utilize telemedicine in my practice now for the last few years. And it's really made a big difference. Um, you know, even, even prior to going to that, let me just start out by saying that as a practicing psychiatrist, you know, I felt that um, there were many patients that would come into my office with sleep issues that weren't being appropriately addressed. And when I finally started addressing those issues, man, did I see a change in their lives and their functioning, in their, in their medical issues and their psychiatric issues. And what's interesting is, you know, being trained in one of the best residencies in the country for psychiatry, we got no education in sleep. You know, as medical students, we get no education in sleep, very little, I should say. So to actually see those patients in practice and start uh, identifying them and actually help, you know, helping those patients get work up, workups, getting sleep tests on, seeing how many of them had sleep apnea, addressing their sleep apnea, and seeing their mood get better, seeing their insomnia get better, seeing their anxiety get better, seeing their blood pressure get better. You know, for me, it was kind of a no-brainer after being in practice as a psychiatrist for a good eight, nine years to say, hey, you know what, I've got to really go and get a fellowship in sleep medicine and get some more training in this and really understand it because I really felt like addressing those sleep issues made a huge impact in my patient population. And so we did that. I did that and got a, you know, I trained with some of the pioneers of sleep at UTSW. And after doing that training, really got a better understanding of in terms of identifying and treating sleep disorders and, you know, moved out to the West Coast here and, and such as history, did practicing sleep medicine now, pretty much solely sleep medicine for the last 12 years. Uh, and then, like I said, you know, using telemedicine has been something that I started really noticing the need for a, uh, a few years back when, you know, I had patients that were driving, you know, 60 miles to see me or that, were, that moved away to maybe, uh, you know, two hours south or Southern California. They say, you know, I got to establish a new relationship with a new doctor. And really, you know, I don't want to do that. I really like working with you. I think that, you know, you've, you've done well for me and I want to keep seeing you. And then I started looking into it. I'm like, well, maybe there's a way. And there was. <laughs> You know, and telemedicine has been around for a while, but I started realizing and understanding that, hey, you know, some insurance payers are willing to pay for this. And I started seeing those patients as they moved away and found that, hey, you know what, this works. And it works well because it's a convenience for the patient. It's a convenience uh, for me. And you know what, we're getting paid for it. We're getting paid for it just like we would an office visit, seeing the patient right here in front of us. So as long as you use the right technology, uh, I found that it was really beneficial for my patients. And then I, you know, and then I got get I started getting referrals from other states. I started um, applying licenses for other states. So I've, I've accumulated a lot of state licenses. But the biggest thing for me is that this now at this point, you know, if, if we didn't have telemedicine, honestly. I'd be doing what every other business is doing. I'd be laying off staff. You know, I'd be uh, really rummaging and trying to uh, pay rent. But telemedicine has really made it um, a, 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 
has helped us at this time at least stay in business and really we're continuing to see our patients so yeah we may be down in terms of volume but still we're seeing a lot of patients through telemedicine it's really made a big difference for us um you know and one thing in terms of when it comes to sleep is that telemedicine and a lot and, and the ability to do home sleep testing can really make the turnaround it quite more efficient and fast for your patient compared to having them necessarily having to see the doctor in the office and then get a sleep study in the office and then having to see the doctor again you know when you look at that you know if there was a there was a study done that showed that by the time the patient get, comes into sleep the doctor initially then gets referred to a sleep specialist gets a sleep study done it takes about three months or longer before they get actually a referral to get any treatment done but with telemedicine you know that can be cut down into into weeks or days sometimes so it has really made a big difference in terms of identifying patients in terms of getting the appropriate treat uh, evaluation and then treatment done so really really a huge change we're seeing in our industry and my, my hope is that we continue to utilize this this um and take advantage of this obstacle you know to really become the way of the future in terms of identifying patients and getting the appropriate treatment and having everyone on board um you know when it comes to oral appliances and using oral appliances in my practice well again it's one of those things where i felt like you know as soon as i came into this industry and started a little more about sleep and starting understanding that hey you know what all these sleep doctors out there and the way we get trained we're really looking at cpap using cpap but guess what some of those patients a lot of them don't like using cpap or some of them don't want to use cpap well when i first started as a novice entering into this field i was like yeah cpap 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 and then i mentioned like well you know what it's not necessarily doing it <laughs> and uh and i started using more and more oral appliances starting started to refer more and more to uh, dentists in the community really uh folks that have been out there and been using oral appliances for a long time and really saw the benefit in my patients when they started on oral appliance therapy. And since then, it's been a no-brainer for me. We really utilize oral appliances in, in the practice significantly to the point where, you know, at me, for me, when I see a patient, you know, it, it becomes part of my conversation in terms of they start want, if they want to try oral appliance first. You know, I'm not focused in on just using CPAP. If they don't want to use CPAP, fine, let's use an oral appliance. I've had patients, not only mild to moderate patients, where we know that, you know, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine is very clear that for mild to moderate patients, this stuff works and it can be very effective. But even for severe patients that don't want to use anything else, hey, you know what, if we can reduce your AHI and we can get you feeling better and we can reduce your chance of having any comorbidities in terms of heart attack, stroke, depression, Dementia now we know is a huge factor. You know, why not? Why aren't we using oral appliances? And so I have really started, I've, I've used the oral appliances now for years and really made it more of a focus in terms of uh, prescribing it for our patients. It's very interesting. I don't know if you all got a chance to see this, but I can forward it to anyone who, who actually does want to see this article. But there was a, there was a really short, nice article that was, uh, that was sent out in Sleep Review just a few days ago in terms of COVID and, you know, actually questioning whether sleep is an essential service, an urgent service, because there is this whole issue about, okay, you know, we got to suspend treatment in terms of anyone who doesn't have an essential problem or, or an urgent need, you know, and, and, and really, I've really felt for my colleagues, dental colleagues, medical colleagues that have had to like close shop, stay at home. But there was a good article that came out in the sleep review where, Dr. Carden, who is the uh, president of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, you know, says that, you know, the, the OSA is considered a potentially life-threatening disease. And, you know, every patient really needs to be evaluated um, individually in terms of the need to get their sleep treated, especially at this time, where we know that sleep can make an impact in the patient's uh, depression, in their thought process, in their memory, and their, their anxiety. And if it is a life-threatening, a physician feels a patient need, needs oral appliance therapy to treat it. And dentists are ready to work with the patient and the referring physician. So that article I felt was really helpful in terms of understanding 
that, hey, you know what? This may be what we consider an obstacle, but we really got to identify those patients and really help them at this time because if we if we don't, you know, their their sleep's going to suffer and that's going to impact their general health overall and make things much more difficult to handle during this especially stressful time. Um, you know, we've had to close down our sleep lab temporarily. But again, what I say to that is that's not a, that's not a big deal because I've been working with Ryan for a while. I've been uh, utilizing home sleep testing for a while and largely home sleep testing can be accurate for the majority of patients out there that have sleep disorder breathing. And it allows us to really at this time keep continuing to provide care and continue to evaluate these patients that are at risk for sleep disorder breathing and sleep apnea. I, there was a question that came up earlier in terms of um, Medicare and face-to-face -face evaluations in terms of telemedicine. I will address that because during this time of uh, emergency, during this COVID crisis, Medicare has actually suspended the previous restrictions that they had on hold, which is one of our big issues we've had for a number of years. We knew that Medicare would not allow uh, telemedicine evaluation unless the patient was in a quote healthcare facility, you know, and in a quote rural area, right? So for our Medicare patients, we kept having them come to the office, which is not very convenient. As we know, for some of these patients, they're struggling for, with a number of issues, have a hard time with transportation sometimes, have a hard time with getting into the office. But at this time, Medicare has actually suspended those restrictions. So we are at this time allowed to do uh, telemedicine evaluations. In fact, Medicare has actually suspended the whole, the whole need for a face-to-face, -face, actually. You can actually get on an audio call uh, on the web, audio, and if you have an interaction, Medicare at this time is going to cover that. So, and, and I'm hoping that this really brings to light um, to society, you know, to healthcare organizations, to the government in the future that, hey, this is a huge piece of technology we have that we're not utilizing to the fullest degree in order to provide the best and most efficient care to the patients out there that need us. So I'll end with that and uh, really appreciate the time. And uh, I'll open up now for if you guys have any questions for me, and then I know we're gonna have a question and answer uh, section at the end as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Singh. Excellent presentation. We appreciate that. Um, I will ask, um, deal with a couple questions here first, and then we're going to switch everything over to Mr. Randy Kern from Pristine Medical Billing. So question for Randy and Dr. Singh, don't some insurance companies require CPAP first for a specified period of time? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, can you hear me? I can. Great. So yeah, some insurance plans do require that, and I'm gonna address that in one of, uh, in, in one of my slides as well. And that's something that we're gonna be looking at um, as a team is to make sure that when we see patients coming over here, we kind of, triage them in a way that we know what the insurance requirements are going to be. So if that uh, insurance does require, and I know South Carolina recently went to, South Carolina BCBS went, recently went to that. Um, I know Wyoming Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, requires that. The FEP programs are starting to require that. Um, and, and again, that was another piece of this puzzle we've been trying to figure out all along. And we finally are able to put this all together in a way that um, when the insurance uh, carrier does require that, um, we can coordinate that, have that done. And if the patient doesn't tolerate the, the, the PAP of trial, um, we can get that patient back to the dental practice. Great. You know what I think I'm going to do, Randy? Let's switch you over and make you the presenter. So I'm going to pass the baton and we'll still continue with the questions. So it should be coming your way that we see your screen. Great. All right, let's continue with some of the more of the questions. Dr. Singh, 
um, multiple requests for a copy of the uh, COVID sleep article, please. If you could um, email that to myself, Ryan and Randy will make sure that the attendees get that. Will do. Um, thank you so much, Doctor. Um, there are have been multiple questions regarding costs. Um, I have recommended to those that I can respond to that you reach out to Ryan and Randy directly for your specific questions regarding cost of treatments uh, for telemedicine, what insurance will pay, um, follow what the, the cost of a, a follow-up sleep study would be to document efficacy of the oral appliance. So please reach out to Ryan and Randy and their um, information was presented at the beginning of the program and I know some people joined us late and that's okay. No worries. Um, we'll follow up with that at the end of the presentation. So Randy, lead on, sir. Take charge and show us how medical billing works. You are the guru, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for having me on here, Dr. Tucker. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. This is really exciting for, for all of us, um, especially for me. Uh, it, it's been a journey. Um, I've been in, like Ryan said, I've been in sleep for about 12, 13 years now, and I've been helping dental practices for the last nine years. And those who are close to me know that they'll get emails or uh, I don't text at two or three in the morning, um, but they'll get emails at two or three in the morning uh, just me uh, trying to figure these things out. How, how do we put the whole thing together to make it easier for people? How do we make it easier for the dental practice? How do we make it easier for the patients um, to move into treatment? How do we make it easier for sleep physicians and dentists to work together uh, harmoniously so that we can move more patients into treatment? Um, and it's been, it's always been like that, 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 that puzzle you just can't quite figure out because there's so many moving parts. There's so much, uh, so many regulations. Um, and it, it's been wonderful that, you know, with, with what's going on, you know, there's, there's a lot of terrible things going on, but we figure out how to make the best of it. And with what's happening with telemedicine and like Dr. Singh talked about with Medicare, and I don't think that's going to go away. Um, and I'll talk about that in a bit, but I think what we can do now is take advantage of the opportunities that are presented to, to ourselves to change what we've been doing. And we finally, in my opinion, um, have been able to figure out this puzzle of one easy pathway to care for the patient. So um, let me see here to advance this. So that what's happened is we talked about all the red tape um, in a lot of that's been taken down as we've been speaking about earlier. We don't have all the restrictions that we've had for many years. And Dr. Singh's been using telemedicine, as you mentioned, three, four, five plus years. But that's not been the case. Only 30% of the physicians across the nation use telemedicine. So 70% of the, the physicians, medical doctors, still aren't using telemedicine. And I doubt very many dentists have ever used telemedicine. Uh, so that means patients aren't getting the, the convenience of it as well. So with everything that's been changing, uh, we've been able to remove a lot of the red tape that's prevented us to give uh, patients easier access to, gear, to care, give the practices um, easier access to the patients. So you can see here, this is the, the AMA, American Medical Association. They have a lot of different things on their website regarding telemedicine and the changes. This is a great resource here. This is um, in one of the articles they wrote, they have a hyperlink where you can click into it, which will also have different hyperlinks you can see here as a source. But the biggest challenge to telemedicine from my research, and some of you guys will see some of the slides that I, I presented last Friday, um, the biggest challenge to telemedicine is it's kind of all over the place, state by state. You know, like Tucker State in, in Pennsylvania, they don't have any legislation for telemedicine. Um, where you and you'll have a good state like Ken Burley State in Arkansas, where they have great legislation for uh, telemedicine. Um, but it's all over the place, and there's no consistency for the medical practices um, and physicians to be able to say, "Okay, I really want to implement this into my my practice," because 
one, there may not be coverage parity. Two, there may not be payment parity. So coverage and payment parity means that the insurance, and this is private insurance, not, not in, I'm not talking about right now Medicare or Medicaid, but private insurance coverage and payment parity is, are two big things that need to happen and I believe will happen for the long term, which has happened right now immediately. But coverage parity, meaning that the the um, insurance, the private insurance carrier has to cover the patients coming into the the medical practice uh, for a telemedicine visit, uh, presenting themselves for a telemedicine visit, the medical practice, the dental practice. They have to have the same type of coverage as if they were there in person. Same deductible, same coinsurance, same copay. It has to be the same. And then payment parity is where they are enacting that the. Uh, the insurance, the private insurance carriers have to pay the physician, the dentist, the provider, the medical provider, the same rate that they would pay as if the, the patient was there in person. And without those parity laws, what's been happening throughout the last probably 10 years, um, I've kind of talked about Wild West, um, is that the insurances have been allowed to just work the way they want to work with telemedicine because there isn't legislation there to tell them that they have to pay. Um, equally or cover equally. And what's been happening is the insurances have been paying only 40% or 50% of their normal, the UCR, usual and customary rate, or the contracted rate in a lot of states. So what you can see here on this screen, and I'll show you in another screen here, but if you see a common thing in all written in red here, coverage parity, payment parity, co coverage parity, coverage parity, coverage parity, payment at the same rate as in-person service. This is the way that they defined it state by state. And you'll see some of these are not even written in red, but it still talks about it. Expand coverage for telemedicine. So California already had it on the books to have, uh, they already have coverage parity, but they already had it on the books for payment parity in 2021. Um, so they, they've already, they, they immediately, this is all due to COVID, immediately expanded coverage to telemedicine services, payment parity within, uh, within person service. And then like Dr. Singh said earlier, Right now, a lot of they're even allowing telephone visits um, just to make sure patients have access to care. Now, that's not going to stay, but what is going to stay is going to be the payment and the coverage parity. So you can see here, look at all the red in these states, um, and you, it's the same thing: coverage parity, coverage parity, uh, coverage parity, payment parity, um, all the way through. And it's my belief, after you know, looking at this, researching it, and, and having a, a greater understanding of now what's been going on, why hasn't telemedicine launched, this is why. And I don't think that we're gonna go backwards with it. I don't think the state legislatures are gonna go and say, hey, we wanna change this. I think this is opening everybody's eyes. And I think they wanna protect people even more. And same with Medicare. I don't think Medicare is gonna go backwards and only cover telemedicine for rural areas. I think we all want to keep people safe and the safest way to, to, to see that patient most of the time with those Medicare patients for basic, uh, for basic office visits will be telemedicine. Um, so my belief after being in the field for a long time and kind of seeing all this play out and seeing it play out now, is I don't think we're going to go backwards. I think we're going to greatly improve um, the pathway for patients to access care. Um, and I think that's going to hold true for Medicare. I think it's going to hold true for the private insurance carriers. You can see Medicaid's all over these things too. Um, so I think the government's going to realize it's important to give patients easier access to care. So I'm very excited about it. I'm sure, you know, um, everybody on this call is very excited about it. Cause like I said earlier, I think we're all on this call because we all have that relentless pursuit to help others, to help patients get into treatment. How can we help people um, and how do we do our part? So this was a slide from last week. I talked to Do uh, Dr. Morgan today. I think he's up to like 16, 17 telemedicine business now. You heard Tucker talk about, I think he did six or seven today as well. Um, I know Dr. Magnuson, Dr. Carsonson up there, Premier. Um, I talked to Rebecca earlier today. They're starting to roll theirs out. Um, I was giving her some tips on billing it. So there are dentists out there doing this now, um, and it's been working for them. So just to retouch on the, the codes that you're going to be using, uh, and again, I apologize if some of these slides are duplicated from my Friday's presentation. I know not everybody on the presentation today was on Friday's presentation. So I am going to share um, some duplicate slides there, but it's, this is a extremely important stuff. Um, use your same codes. 
You're going to be using the same 992 codes that you would typically use if the patient's there in person with you. Um, you want to attach a modifier 95. That's going to tell the insurance company this is a telemedicine visit. So a 95 modifier indicates on the claim it's a telemedicine visit. You want to use place of service 11 like you would if the patient was there um, with the private insurance carriers. If for some reason you do get a denial, um, resubmit it with the place of service 2. So we did have HealthNet this week deny one of ours um, from that place of service 11, and they denied it and required us to send it back with the POS 2. No problem. We just resubmitted a corrected claim with the place of service 2. And then continue documenting. So don't change the thing you're doing as far as documenting your, your um, office visits. Those are official medical records. Uh, you want to continue. You're a specialist. Um, you want to continuing uh, continue documenting the total time you're spending with the patient. So you want to document that. You want to document that 50% or more is counseling um, and the content of the counseling. So don't change a thing in your documentation either. Obviously, the patient can't be there for your full, full workup and exam. That's fine. But you do have to make sure you're still document, documenting an office visit, the way evaluation and management uh, office visits should be documented by a specialist based on time. So extremely important if you guys are billing this yourself or working with the billing service, this is, uh, it's very viable, it's working, um, just follow these rules. And again, uh, I just wanted to show, this was some stuff we showed last week. These are some payments we've already been receiving for telemedicine visits. Um, so that, that, like Dr. Singh said earlier, without telemedicine, he would be laying people off. Same with some of the dental practices that we're working with. Without telemedicine, they wouldn't have been able to bring some income in, um, and they probably would have been making, been making more drastic changes than they are right now. So these are some payments that we, we started off with. Um, the first one we got right here, you can see it was reduced. Uh, we used the place of service two on this one. Got reduced by $30 from the normal rate, normal range that that typically would pay paid at. Uh, paid at $55. Hey Tucker, I don't know if somebody doesn't have their phone on mute, but I get a little—I have a little background. Yeah, so everybody should be on mute. I have all on mute. Um, so if okay. someone, yeah, you sure you didn't spill okay. your coffee on yourself? <laughs> no, not nah, not this time. <laughs> all right. Um, so, anyways. $55 on that first one, and then we started changing it to the POS 11 um, with that modifier, and uh, we started seeing some better allowables. So you see a $97 allowable here for the 99213. You see a nine, uh, an $81 allowable here for the 99213. Obviously, these are patient portions, um, so the total going to be collected is going to be up to that allowable. So these doctors are collecting this amount up to the allowable. And then here's a 99203, same thing, uh, allowed 139. Um, and I think that he's recently, we just got a TRICARE payment. Um, I think that one was like $83 and another one of these uh, payments from Scripps Hospital. So again, we talked about Doxy.me. Um, I don't have any, I don't own any part of Doxy.me. I don't have any financial interest in Doxy.me, but you've probably heard me speak about it a few times. Um, if you're a client of Pristine, you received an email right when this all started happening. Um, I think that was two weeks ago, and we recommended uh, Doxy.me because the previous providers that I've worked with and physicians that I've worked with in the past, they, um, like Dr. Singh, like Tucker used today, the, it's the ease of use for the patients. Uh, it was the easiest one, and Ryan and I actually sat down about a year ago, and we went through a, a lot of different uh, platforms there. We were researching DC, we researched Doxy.me, um, and a few other ones. So we knew, coming back into this, that, hey, this is extremely easy for the patient to use. And I think, in my opinion, that's the most important thing. Let's make this a great patient experience. So everything we're talking about today in our presentation and our new workflows and this pathway is all about how do we make it easy for the dental practice and how do we make it extremely easy for the, the patient to go through these steps. Um, and from all the softwares that I've seen, this one's easy. You click a button, it turns on, it turns on the camera, it turns on the audio, and you're in the doctor's waiting room. If the doctor's there, you're already talking to the doctor with one click of a button. So extremely easy to use. Um, it, in, in a matter of fact, 
uh, this question came up the other day too during that broadcast, during Friday's broadcast was, uh, can we use Facebook Live? Uh, somebody asked about that. Um, so you can see this is back on the AMA's website and they talked about this. There's a lot of great information on there if you guys wanna look into that. But they talked about uh, no, Facebook Live um, is not, I doubt anybody on this call is using Twitch or TikTok. Um, so those are not, those are public facing communication services. They, those are not eligible. And even though they're not enforcing HIPAA law right now, I still wouldn't recommend using those as OCR here said, so do not use those, but you see, they do have a uh, doxy.me on here as a recommended, uh, service as well from the American medical association. Um, they had BC, they have UpDocs, you can use Zoom for healthcare. Um, so these are all gonna be HIPAA compliant with B BAAs on file, that they will give you the BAA to keep on file. And then the last thing I have on this is just, there's a professional, so it's free. Uh, as some of the doctors were, were, that are using it now, they're using the free version, it's free, um, and real, real simple to get signed up. But they also have a professional service that's really reasonable for $35 a month. And that's gonna do almost everything that I've seen any other one do. It does the screen share if you wanna trade screens. You can do file transfer. So if the patient already had a sleep study before, you can grab that sleep test and have them transferred up to you, HIPAA secure file transfer. You can collect payments on it if you sign up. I know I have a doctor that's waiting, it says three days. I have a doctor down in Florida that signed up with Doxy's professional service. Um, and it's three to five days to get the payment set up, linked into their bank account. Um, so he's going to start taking payments on his, so you could take payments there. They have tele, uh, teleconsent coming pretty soon. And right now, if you go back to look at your state laws, um, they're not really enforcing. A lot of them aren't uh, enforcing the consent, but I'm sure that they are going to start enforcing. Once they start going back to the HIPAA regulations, they will start enforcing the, the teleconsent rules. Uh, they do have that coming on Doxy.me. And then they have the text and email notifications um, coming there as well, which is important so that your patients get a text reminder like five minutes before the, the, the visit so they don't forget or 10 minutes before the visit, whatever you set that to, so they don't forget that they have a visit with you. So great value there. And again, from everything that I've heard from you know all the practices and doctors that we work with, this is the one that they like to go with. So, oh, this is a game changer. Um, everything that we're talking about today is a game changer. Uh, it's been frustrating for us for so long to just have simple a simple way to do things, and th this is changing the game. So before, um, you know, as a dentist, we didn't know which way to go. Uh, we, as a billing service, you know, we we have we're kind of like the hub of information. So, you know, we have a lot of active clients who will ask us, you know, should I buy my own HST? Should I outsource my HST? What does Medicare require? What does United Healthcare require now? They just changed their rules. What are the dental boards requiring, right? So there's been a lot of confusion and a lot of dental practices getting into this or dental practices that have been in this for a while. They don't know which way to go. Um, and they, they're always thinking, am I doing the right thing? Am I not doing the right thing? Can I order a sleep study? Can, you know, am I not supposed to order a sleep study? Can I send it home? Oh wait, Medicare, I can't send it home because it says right there in the LCD that that's a conflict of interest. You can't be involved in treatment and you know diagnosis. Um, no part, no aspect in Medicare is that you can send home an HST. So there's all these different rules out there and the dental practices get confused all the time. And, and we, even as professionals and experts, get confused, we try to keep up with it. So this is what we're talking about now. We want clear guidelines, we want access, and then what, what's going on with telemedicine, what's going on with Medicare, which I don't think is going to change. I think this is gonna be the future of healthcare. Um, it's going to give us the ability to do that. And as Ryan presented earlier, there's so many ways now we can work with the dental practices and give them one clear pathway, one easy pathway to get into this. So like uh, we mentioned earlier, it's compliant for everything, it meets Medicare LCD at this point. Again, I don't think they're gonna change. Um, it meets private insurance policies. So as, as we've seen, uh, United Healthcare recently changed back in August for their uh, qualifying requirements for oral appliance therapy, it meets that. I also think other insurance carriers are gonna start going that way, going towards the Medicare um, the rules there or uh, other organizational rules. 
Uh, it meets every dental board criteria. It meets AASM and AADSM protocols. So every box is checked. It even, it's just, this is even Burley proof. So I had a conversation with Kim Burley about a week and a half ago to make sure that there's everything on here that we're not missing. And we spoke for about an hour and a half. Um, and he loves it. It, it, it. This meets everything and this is everything that the dentist should, will need to stay compliant with every guideline that we have out there. So the other key um, is minimizing the patient out-of-pocket cost. And this has been critical. And we see here at Pristine, we see how many patients come into our system. We also bill for sleeptest.com. And we have since the, in, almost since the inception, we, we see all of their patients come in. We see all of the practices patients come in. So we have a great idea of what patient actually gets screened, tested, and then actually moves into treatment, goes through the pre-authorization and, and accepts the treatment. Um, and the biggest, the, the biggest factor there for patients is cost. So, and it's very obvious when we're running benefit checks all the time, we know, okay, this patient's probably gonna move forward. Oh, this is a great one. Um, oh, this is a tough one. So it's critical when we started building this model to get the patient to the dental practice and, and have the, make it so much easier for the dental practice to close the deal how do we even get the patient tested at a very affordable rate? How do we get them in front of a physician at affordable rate? And that's when we wanted to connect with in and have an in-network model, um, which will be used most of the time. So when we can use an in-network model to put the patient through the, the, the system, they can get a telemedicine visit. The average visit is going to be about a $40 copay or coinsurance, whatever that's going to be. Um, the sleep study is going to be about a $68, uh, $68 average there for a two-night study because that's going off of the contracted rates that we're seeing out there for in-network testing. So average patient out of pocket. If they're, and again, this is if deductible has been met in-network, which a lot of times their deductible is met in-network, especially towards the second half of the year. So that's going to be very affordable for the patient to do the study. Um, sleep test, uh, you know, will be interpreted RX written, as Ryan said. They'll do another follow-up with the sleep physician. Um, so you have the same sleep physician as well. So now we can talk about continuity of care. You have the first physician that they're speaking with, the same second physician with, that they're speaking with. And again, these are sleep physicians that we're, we're, we're tagging in to do all of this. So that patient's going to get the first telemed visit with the same sleep physician that they're going to have the follow-up uh, visit with as well. So you have that continuity of care where the patient's uh, going to be a little bit more invested because they see that the dental practice is working with sleep physicians who are also invested. Um, and that's only going to be a $40 visit as well. So the average cost from what we can tell, Ryan hit on it earlier, he said under $200, that, that's spot on. And again, yeah, there'll be times where patients have deductible remaining, um, but it won't be quite this low. But a lot of times the office visit isn't going to be subject to deductible, especially in network. Um, and sometimes the sleep testing will not be. It, it's a diagnostic test. Their plan may be written where that's not going to be subject to deductible if it goes in network. So this is going to be extremely affordable to get your patient from screening all the way to the second visit with a sleep physician. And I think that's a huge factor because now when the dental practice gets the patient back, that patient has only spent $168, maybe $200, but look at everything they've received in the comfort of their own home. They never had to leave their house and they got all of this care already given to them. So that's going to be a huge success just to start getting patients to at least get tested. And Again, when you have that second, that second visit with that same, same sleep physician, and that sleep physician is oral appliance friendly and can really talk to the patient about the importance of getting therapy and the ramifications of not getting therapy, I think that's going to move more patients into treatment as well. And that's something that we've been missing. Um, so once that does happen, and the patient's gone through that system, like Ryan said, the patient will be handed off to Pristine. So we're all working in unison here um, all the way through the process. So the patient will be handed off to Pristine, the Rx is done, qualifying sleep study is done, and then what Pristine is gonna do, we're gonna take over the patient at that point, we're gonna call the insurance, 
We're going to find out what the insurance is going to cover for the patient, what the deductible is, what the patient's uh, um, out-of-pocket cost is going to be for the treatment, and what we expect the insurance to pay. So we're going to start that right away, and we're also going to start initiating the pre-authorization. So as soon as Pristine gets the, their hands on the patient, which is right after the second telemedicine visit with a sleep physician, we start the pre-authorization, we start doing the verification of benefits. Within 48 hours, we'll let the, the dental practice know what our estimates are. I don't want the dental practice to present the case yet. I think it's important for the dental practice to present the case after the pre-authorization is done. Similar to what you guys are doing with, um, with pre-Ds and dentistry, let's have everything done so when you bring the patient in, you can present the case with the full, full pre-authorization. So this is what it looks like in our cloud system that we have. We do a very detailed benefit check. None of our benefit checks are done um, on, a, on an online system. There's too much information that we need to know. Again, we're doing all this very intelligently. Um, we want to know if gaps available. We want to know if there's a durable medical equipment uh, maximum on the plan. We want to know if a pre-auth is required. So all of these are call-ins. Um, with a with the reference number so that we can always go back if anything goes wrong to appeal the case But these are call-in benefit checks, and this is what it looks like we give the coaching over here on the right hand side um, And this is our cloud system that we provide that to our clients with Oh Hold on. I went, let me go back one. Sorry um, And then the pre-authorization we'll start the pre-auth too so you see the comments over here you have the pre-authorization started. And then when we initiate the pre-authorization, um, we're going to update the client every three to five business days that, on the pre-auth status. Typically, it's going to take about two weeks to get the pre-auth approved, maybe a little bit longer if there's a gap there, but if the, the practice can just hang tight, we got the sleep, we already got the sleep study done, we got the RX, the LOMN, um, we got the benefit check done. Now the last piece of the puzzle to present it to the patient is going to be the pre-authorization. So that's probably gonna be about two weeks, maybe three, if there's a gap involved. And then this is what it looks like in DS3. We also work in the back end of DS3, so you can use this program seamlessly as, as a DS3 client as well. Um, this is our coaching in DS3. You can see up here it says patient coaching, um, and we'll put those, that exact same comment in the software there, whatever we think the patient out-of-pocket cost is gonna be, um, and what we think the insurance is gonna pay. And then the authorization information will be there as well. So this system uh, works, oops, uh, sorry, I'm getting a little click happy here. Um, this system works well with our cloud system. It also works very well in the back end of DS3 software. Um, and it's important, again, that we do all this ahead of time because what we want you as a dentist to be able to do is be able to have everything you need to present the case to the patient. By the time he gets back to you, we want to prevent, for so many years, there's all this back and forth. Oh, you forgot to send you know, the letter of medical necessity, oh, you forgot to send a CPAP intolerance or CPAP statement or clinical records um, to show no TMD or whatever that it may be. With so, so much back and forth, it, with this system, it's all going to be tight knit and we're going to be able to get everything back to the dental practice. So the dental practice now can say, hey, we have great news, Larry. We've checked with your insurance carrier. They've pre-authorized the treatment. They also feel you need this treatment as well, so they've already pre-authorized the treatment. Your out-of-pocket cost is going to be $700, and we're going to bill your insurance for the remaining balance. So we want the dental practices to now have everything they need and to be able to present the case with the pre-authorization or GAP approved so there's no going backwards. And you'll be able to sell that case a lot easier when you tell the patient that, hey, your insurance has already approved the treatment. Now it's up to you. You know, we have, we've done everything that, you needed, that, that needed to be done. The insurance agrees you need the treatment. Now it's up to you, Mr. Patient, to go ahead and move forward. And my guess is after that patient has already gone through a very affordable process at the beginning, had two visits with the sleep physician, they're probably going to buy into this a little bit more. And then after they see that their insurance has already approved it as well, it should be a lot easier to close cases moving forward. Um, so then you take the impressions. So the patient says, yes, I want to move forward. Go ahead and take the impressions after you present the out-of-pocket cost. And then 
as Ryan mentioned earlier, something we're going to do at Pristine as well, especially during this time, um, we will even connect with your patients and do a case presentation, a financial and insurance case presentation to your patients through the same uh, telemedicine platform. So we'll make sure that all of our information is going to be HIPAA compliant as well. We want the patient to feel safe. The patient by this point should be very familiar with using the, the doxy.me that we're all using. So it should be easy and not foreign to the patient. And if the, the dental practice um, doesn't have the staff right now, you know, to present the cases, maybe the person that normally presents the financials for medical insurance to your patient has been furloughed, um, we can step in and we can help you out. So if you do need to present a case to a patient, um, we will do that for you. Um, if you want to do that long term, we can work out a way we can do that for you long term as well. But um, I know that's one of the biggest challenges to dental practices out there too is, you know, they, we can give them the number to present the case, which is a, a huge, a huge uh, offering as well. But I know they struggle if the patient starts to ask questions about their medical insurance. You know, why do I have to pay $700? Why do I have to pay $1,400? You know, can you explain that to me? Um, and I know dental practices, their team, they just, they're just not familiar with it. They're maybe treating three, five, maybe 10 patients a month, but they just don't have the knowledge when they start getting asked questions by the patients about their insurance coverage to confidently answer those questions. Um, some practices we work with, they can do that. Some practices we work with, they already have sleep physicians. In this system, if you already have a sleep physician that you're working with um, and you're working with medical doctors in your community, keep doing it. We're not telling you, hey, this system is better than working with your local sleep physicians. No way in hell will we ever say that. That's, that's the, the ultimate goal, and that's what we would love to have all of our dental practices on, being able to work with our local physicians. All of our top clients, our high volume clients, have relationships with local sleep physicians, but that takes a while to build. Um, and we know that, that, that only probably 10% of the dentists in our industry have those relationships. But to be very clear, we want you to have those relationships. But for those who don't have those relationships, we are here to offer this service to help you out. And same with the medical insurance. You know, if you need help closing medical insurance cases from the experts and you're struggling closing those cases, right now, um, for sure, we are going to help you do that. And we're probably going to help you guys in the future do that as well. It's something that we at Pristine feel we need to take the next step. And, and take some of that over, take that off the plate of the dental practice. So when you think about that, that should also help close more cases as well because you'll have the experts on the phone with the patient. If the patient asks, why does it cost a certain amount or what's my deductible or, or I thought I met my deductible or why did my, did, did my deductible reset? I didn't know I wasn't on a calendar year. I didn't know I was, I'm on a fiscal year. There's a lot of variables that go into medical insurance that um, we would be equipped to handle those questions. So this is what y'all used to look like when you left a sleep symposium. This is what I look like after we figured this out. So to me, it's extremely exciting stuff. I'm jazzed, I've been jazzed. Um, Ryan and I have been talking on the phone day and night for weeks now, uh, putting this all together. Um, and we're extremely excited to offer this to our, uh, everybody out there um, because I think this is a game changer. I think this is going to make things 10 times easier on the dental practice. So we touched on this earlier. So now I'm going to kind of go through some preset questions that I think most dental practices will have before we go into a QA. and a um, So I'm going to go through probably for about eight slides to answer some of the questions that you may already have. Um, so if the patient needs a PAP trial, we talked about this a little earlier, um, that's another thing that we want to do to help out. And Ryan touched on this, and we get that same question all the time. Okay, a patient came back with severe sleep apnea. I'm not working with the local doctor. Um, you know, what should I do with that patient? First, if you want to work with the local doctor, it's a great way to work with the local doctor, right? It's a great way to go in and start referring patients to local physicians. But if you don't have those relationships and you need help, um, we're here to help with that as well. So again, if you have those relationships or you want to use these referrals to build those relationships, please, I highly recommend you do that. Um, but 
if you need a solution, we're here to be a solution for you in this aspect as well. We can get that patient set up on an auto PAP. Um, we can have one shipped to their home. If they need a trial, a CPAP trial, if they do have a type of insurance that requires that, um, we understand that happens sometimes. We can get that coordinated um, and then get the patient back to you if they you know, don't pass the trial, um, if they're not compliant on CPAP. Um, so we're here, uh, again, as an end-to-end -end solution. Anything that you need, we want to provide that for you. Um, patient already has a sleep study but does not have an Rx, no recommendation for oral appliance treatment. We get this quite a bit, too. Um, so maybe the patient is CPAP intolerant. Maybe they had a sleep test done a year ago, 18 months ago, um, but they can't tolerate their their uh, sleep test, no problem. That, that uh, or I'm sorry, can't tolerate their, uh, their CPAP um, or BiPAP. We, we will handle that as well. So that type of patient would go directly to Pristine. They don't need to do another sleep study. Um, that'll go directly to Pristine. We will coordinate the telemedicine visit uh, with one of the sleep physicians that we're working with, and they will get the Rx for you. So no more, hey, you have to go back, oh, you know, sorry, Joe, I know you have a sleep study, you qualify, you can't tolerate a CPAP. Um, go back through this maze of seven doctors to get a, you know, get an appointment and get a prescription back to us or the dental or the dental practice calling the doctor's office every day for three weeks just to talk to somebody for two minutes to ask for a prescription. That, that, that's a pain in the ass for everybody. We all know that. We've all been there and done that. Anyone who's been in this game for a little while, we hate chasing down the prescription for patients who already have sleep studies that qualify. So no problem, they come into you, they have a sleep study that already qualifies. They, that sleep study did not have oral appliance treatment as a recommendation. Um, they probably just had CPAP. Uh, no, we'll get that over to a sleep physician so that they could do a telemedicine visit and then get the letter of medical necessity, the clinical notes, and the prescription that we will need to qualify that patient for medical insurance coverage. Um, if it's a little over two, uh, over two years old, the general rule in our industry is two years. If you get over two years, um, we like to, the insurance typically will like to see something new. We can stretch it sometimes to three, but we like to keep them at two years or newer. So if you again go back to the affordability of the whole pathway at an average of $168, it's probably best just to have the patient if they have a, a three-year-old, four-year-old sleep study. Let's just do it again and have them go through the system. It's a really easy system, and that way we don't have any delays or we're not arguing and appealing author pre-authorizations with the insurance carrier. Um, what if GAP isn't available in your area or insurance carrier doesn't offer it? That's kind of what Ryan talked about earlier. There are some practices that it makes sense to stay out of network. Um, you know, there are some practices that we bill with or bill for that are contracted providers for dental sleep medicine. There are some practices that we bill for that don't have any contracted providers nearby and they um, can get GAP approvals fairly easily. Um, but then we also have uh, providers that are in an area that uh, there's a contractor provider and they can't get, get GAP approval and maybe Pristine's working on an in-network contract for them, but we know that's going to take about eight months, nine months to get that in-network contract. So what are we going to do for nine months when they can't get a GAP approval um, to use the patient's in-network benefits? What are we going to do for those nine months? Or if it's an insurance like UMR, uh, UMR doesn't offer GAP approvals, so that or certain policies don't offer GAP approvals. What's the solution to ensure that we can still get a decent payment from the insurance carrier for oral appliance treatment? Well, the solution is keep it in the same model that we were doing before and test those patients out of network. So again, talking about doing this intelligently, we're going to have an intelligent path for each practice. What pra what's this practice? What, what are the practice's parameters? Do they get GAP? Do they not get GAP? Are they in network? Is this insurance carrier offer GAP? Does it not get GAP? What's the best way to go with this patient to reduce the patient's out-of-pocket cost, not just for the sleep study, but to make it affordable for the patient to move into treatment? So we're also going to take a look at that and move the patient whichever direction we think is the best interest of the patient financially and for the practice to be able to close those patients more consistently. What about HMO patients who need referrals from their PCP uh, for testing and treatment? Well, the HMO patients, um, they can come in as a cash pay. Um, so they can come through the system as a cash pay, uh, or they can go back through their healthcare system and work through their healthcare system to get a referral. 
Um, to bill an HMO, it, it's very difficult to go on a national level to bill HMOs. Those are all local managed contracts. And uh, their system, like Kaiser, um, that you're familiar with, or some of the other larger HMOs or smaller HMOs in your area, um, they're a tight-knit system. They make the patient go back to see their PCP. The PCP has to put her in a referral to the sleep physician. So the patient has to go, you know, have like three or four appointments or at least two before they can get the sleep study. Um, so you can send the patient back to their system and then... Uh, we can piggyback that with the gap approval or an in-network exception um, if that HMO doesn't have a dental sleep medicine provider in it. Or the patient can just move through this system as a cash pay patient. Um, up to the patient. You know, what, what do they want for convenience? Is it worth it to them just to pay cash and go through our system? And they still have all the clinical records we would need to get the in-network exception for treatment? Or is it better if the patient just says, look, I'll go get my sleep study done in network and come back to you after that? That's fine. Either way, we just would have that be a patient choice. Um, what about TRICARE patients? So good news on TRICARE patients as well. Um, telemedicine visits uh, are covered on some of the TRICARE, TRICARE plans without referrals. So we don't have to, some of these TRICARE plans, they don't have to go back to their, their base doctor or their PCP to get a referral for a telemedicine visit. Some of them will cover without it. For those that do need to go back to their PCP to get a referral for the telemedicine visit, um, Dr. Singh has graciously offered a military discount to see those patients at $50, which is 45, almost half of what the normal cash fee out there is for a sleep physician to do a telemedicine visit. So typically, if it's going to be a cash fee for a sleep physician, not a nurse practitioner, but for a sleep a physician, that's normally going to be normally going to be around $90, $95, right? So he's going to help the military patients out. He's going to give them a great discount, almost half off. If they just want to pay cash for the telemedicine visit and not go back through their system and go through the kind of the pain in the butt of going back and getting a referral. Um, then the sleep study, that typically does not need a referral. Rarely does that need a referral. That'll be covered by TRICARE. Um, and if you take the, the, those two things combined, some of these TRICARE patients won't pay anything. So some TRICARE, and I'm sure you guys are aware of this that have been treating TRICARE, um, some of the TRICARE patients are covered at 100%. They wouldn't pay anything, especially if they don't need a referral. Um, and even those that need a referral, the most they're going to pay is $160. And even if you go through a cash, so say the patient has to pay cash pay twice, that's 100 bucks, right? And then TRICARE allows that Medicare rate. So Medicare rate for uh, home seat studies only about $130. Okay, so you go times two on that, you're at 260, covered at 20%, typically or cost share at 20% for that, your patient's only at $52 there, right? So if you use that scenario, a TRICARE patient, even with cash pay through the telemedicine, is only gonna pay $152 to go through all of this and have this all done remotely for their convenience. So we have TRICARE covered pretty well as well, um, and thanks to Dr. Singh offering a deep discount for those who serve. Um, and then what if the insurance requires a C-study be scored at a 4% desaturation rate? So we know that. We know what insurances out there do require that, and that's kind of been a challenge for dental practices too, because they, you know, whichever way they're doing the sleep testing, maybe they don't know it's supposed to be scored at 4% versus 3%. Well, Pristine knows that because that's what we do every day. Uh, we work insurance policies all day long for coverage for appliances. So if we see that this insurance company is going to need a 4% DSAT scoring instead of a 3%, we're going to give it a 4% DSAT scoring so that we can qualify that patient for oral appliance therapy. So that's been thought of and taken care of as well. What if I already own a, or lease an HST device? Great, if you have one, use that device to do titration studies. Um, I talk to dentists all the time and they love to do titration studies with the devices they have. So I'm not saying don't even go out and buy your own device. If you wanna go out and buy a device, um, most of the dentists that I work with that use companies like sleeptest.com um, or refer out, refer out they have a device. They want to know how their patients are doing on treatment. If you want to send it to sleeptest.com, they'll do it for you as well. Or if you want to purchase your own home sleep testing device or you have your own home sleep testing device, that's wonderful. Check your patient's efficacy. Make sure they're doing well on their treatment so that you can send that patient's results back, eventually send those patient's results back to their medical doctor so they know that you've optimized that treatment and you're taking care of their, your mutual patient. 
So um, I still say that, that, you know, you should have a young HST in your practice so you can, you know, titrate your patients. And then what if the patient's reluctant to schedule the, 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 sleep, the, the uh, sleep physician consultation that leads to the sleep study? Get a pulse ox. Um, I, you know, that's back in the day, and, and Dr. Singh can attest to this. I used to, nine, ten years ago, I used to run a, a couple of sleep labs in addition to respiratory care companies. And well, that was the way that we used to get before home sleep testing was around. That was the way that we used to convince patients to come in for a PSG. Nobody wants to come in, spend the night in a lab, and have 37 or 57 or whatever wires are going to be attached to you um, and, uh, and go through that process. So the way that they would get the patients to come in uh, back in the day, the pulmonologist that we were working with, they would send them home with the pulse ox, right? So the same thing a dental practice should be doing too. So if you have a patient that's reluctant to go home and, and, and or schedule right there um, or go home and schedule whatever they're going to do with one of the sleep physicians, then at least send them home with the pulse ox. They're, they're not expensive. They're very affordable. And it's a way you can just show your patient, hey, I, I know you're not scheduling today or I know you may not be too interested in this, but at least I want to check on how you're doing at night. How are you breathing at night? So take this home. There's no cost to you. Bring it home or bring it back to us in a couple days. It's recordable. It's going to rec record your oxygen levels. And, and that should be another way that you can get those patients to move into at least doing a sleep a, a consultation with the sleep physician. Um, getting exhausted here. I'm almost done. Should I go in network for this model? This is a question we get all the time, too. Um, do I go in network? Do I stay out of network? What should I do? My answer, the general answer I give practices all the time is, if you're in an area and there's no in-network providers around you and you don't think there's going to be in-network providers around you and you can get gap approvals, then you can stay out of network. If you've been successful staying out of network, if you've been successful getting gap approvals and it's working for you, don't fix what's not broken, right? But if you aren't successful or you do want to start making that move, there are some things that are going to help you, especially with this system. You're definitely going to increase case acceptance because you're going to be reducing patient out-of-pocket costs because you're going to have an in-network rate and consistently, consistently be able to use their in-network benefits. Um, you're going to speed up the pre-authorization process because you're not waiting for the pre-auth and a gap approval. Um, you're going to get consistent reimbursement not only on the oral appliance, but on radiology and office visits. So if you're going to move into the realm of doing uh, office visits and telemedicine office visits for follow-up visits, you know, two, three months down the line, six months down the line, one year down the line, well, if you're out of network, they're not going to give you a gap approval for an office visit. You know, um, they give you gap approvals because there's not dental sleep medicine doctors that can deliver the oral appliance that, that are in network in the area. So if your goals are to say, oh, this telemedicine system's great, and, you know, something like Tucker's doing, like talk, Dr. Todd Morgan's doing, and Magnuson and Carsonson and many other doctors that we're working with that I know are in network with most of the carriers, they can consistently do these telemedicine visits um, for many years to come. Because, like I said, I think it's all going to change. So I, if they're in network, they can get consistent reimbursement day in and day out on those office visits, on follow-up visits. So month six, month nine, one year follow-up. Because typically when you just bill an office visit and you're out of network, you're not getting a gap on that, right? So that's another thing to consider um, where you want to go with this and where do you want to go with telemedicine. Um, and then also it eliminates uh, letters from the insurance carriers going to your patients to try to send them somewhere else. That's another thing that is, you know, a thorn in the side for these practices that try to get gaps sometimes is if there is an in-network provider or the insurance thinks there's an in-network provider because there's, there's an oral surgeon in network, then sometimes the insurance will play a little dirty there and try to send your patient when you're trying to get a gap approval over to another dentist for treatment and tell the patient, oh, we have dentist, you know, Jane Doe over here who's in network. We think you should see the in-network dentist and said, uh, and then we're going back and having to explain to the patient, oh, sorry, no, that, that's an oral surgeon. It becomes a mess, right? So that's another benefit of being in network is you eliminate all that stuff going back and forth from your, the insurance carriers trying to send your patients to another dental practice. 
Um, and then the last thing is obvious, you can market yourself as an in-network or a per preferred provider to the public, to the medical community, um, because that's important to, you know, everybody out there that when they're being cost conscious of what they're going to do with their treatments and where they're going to refer their patients. So I just want to go through this. Um, and sorry, I know I'm going longer. We're probably like, what, almost on two hours? We knew it was going to be two hours. So let me go on this. Just to re go through the process. And again, our main goal here, everybody who's been putting this together behind the scenes, our main goal is to simplify everything for the dental practice so we can expand treatment. We can give more access, easier access to patients out there. So the dentist role now with this system, just screen, identify, that's all you have to do. You focus on working with, with, with your patients and your staff to find those patients that are in your practice um, or marketing yourself to other people out there to start getting patients. So you screen and identify patients and then sleeptest.com takes it from there. They start coordinating with the sleep physician. Sleep physicians get involved. They take it in uh, for the telemedicine visits and the prescription, um, the clinical notes. Pristine starts the pre-authorization process. We calculate the patient's out-of-pocket cost. Um, then we will, um, oh, and we will also over here, if needed, present the financials and insurance co coverage to the patient. Um, and then after that, if the patient needs a PAP, uh, a BiPAP or a CPAP, if they need PAP therapy, Pristine will handle that for the practice. Then if not, goes right back to the, dental, the dentist role, again, deliver therapy, and then back to Pristine to bill and get the dentist reimbursed. So if you look at this, two things that the dentist does in this. What is the dentist good at? Delivering therapy, right? That's what the dentist is great at. That's your specialty. The other part here, this is your team specialty. Your team specialty is working with their patients to identify patients or identify those patients that need help. So now, and look at our specialties. This puts everybody to play in their strengths and let the specialists do what the specialists do, and that's gonna create more treatment um, and drive more patients into care. So real quick, oh, sorry, this is tough to read. Just what we do, again, this isn't about us selling our services. You won't see any pricing on here from me. If you wanna talk pricing, you could talk pricing, but we do medical billing, we do credentialing, in and in-network contracting, we get our practices enrolled with Medicare, and we do team training. So those are the services that we offer. That's how we fit in this puzzle. Um, if you want to uh, connect with us, all you got to do is go to our website down here at the bottom. Sorry, these got cut off a little bit. Um, and they just click on the button. This is on our main page of our website. Just scroll to the very bottom of the page and then click schedule a sales call. And we'll get on the phone and explain our service in, in greater detail than what I just did. Um, and then here's our information. So. If you're already a client of sleeptest.com, but not a client of Pristine, obviously contact us, schedule a call with us on our website or shoot me an email. If you're a client of Pristine, not a client of sleeptest.com yet, shoot Ryan an email. If you're not a client of either of our services yet, please start with Ryan um, and then he's going to uh, work with you first. And then after Ryan is com com uh, finishes his presentation with you, he'll forward you over to Pristine and we'll take it from there. We like to just keep that in the same sequence kind of as the flow of, of um, the, our, our standard workflow. So uh, that's all I have. Um, I'll give it back to you. But before I leave, I just want to take a moment and thank all of the healthcare workers that are out there. Um, those of you who know me know my wife's on the front lines, and, and I just want to take a moment to recognize all of their efforts um, and, and uh, honor those who have, have, have passed away in fighting for us and fighting for our families and fighting for our communities um, because it, they're extremely brave right now. They get up and go to work every day and put their lives on the line for us. So I think it's important that we always stop and, and, and think about what they're doing out there. It, it, it's uh, very commendable. So thank you, John, Dr. Tucker, or Tucker, sorry. Thank you, Tucker, for having me on. Um, it's been a privilege, privilege to present, and I'm looking, I'm, as you can tell in my voice, I'm very excited about this. This is a long time coming for, for what I've been trying to accomplish in the industry.
Yeah, and congratulations to um, you, Randy, Ryan, and Dr. Singh for putting this all together. It's been something that's, uh, in my opinion, 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 well needed, and especially uh, the crisis that we're going through right now and those individuals that do need help. So I appreciate all that you've done. I appreciate everyone's presentation tonight. And I know that we went over, um, and thank you for all those individuals that, that hung in there. I'm going to uh, go back to me and um, hopefully everybody can see the uh, screen with the question mark. Is everybody good with that, Randy? Yep, I see it. All right, great. See ya. So we, good deal. So we did have some great questions. Um, I don't want to spend a, a, a ton of time. A lot of questions over costs and, and I would recommend that you discuss that with Ryan and Randy per your individual circumstance. Here's a good one that I uh, would hope the three of you would chime in on. I screen patients in my office. Should I be contacting the patient's MD of record prior to the telemed consult and the HST? You want, you want Great to question. take on Brian? Yeah, you know what, I, Dr. can you hear me Dr. well, Tucker? Yeah, no. it, some, someone take it. Just to say no. who you are, please. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Singh. Well, I think hey, it'd be great hey, you want to share? I mean, it, it absolutely does not hurt to contact the MD of record in terms of letting them know what you think uh, in yeah. terms of... You know what? Why don't we all share our webcams real quick? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. There you go. All right. Let me see if I can get this going. All right. Hmm. So I, I don't think it hurts in terms of uh, sharing with your M MD of record in terms of what's happening with the patient, what you're thinking in terms of uh, you know, getting a home sleep test on, referring for further treatment, that sort of thing. Um, depending, I mean, most patients, you don't, you won't necessarily have to do that in terms of if they have a PBO or they're uh, paying out of network and that sort of thing. You can refer them onwards right away. You guys have anything to add to that? Uh, Ryan well, let me concur. Yeah, I think I'd like to concur with you and share some other insights too. Um, two things. Uh, we all, everybody on this call believes in collaborative care. I've done that for my father. I've done that with myself. I've done that with my wife with regards to our own apnea or UARS. Um, so I think that's a big deal. As far as the pre-test consultation there, I'd like to say, you know, not to say don't do it. I'm just saying we're going to connect you with sleep physicians who are effectively going to take your referral form with all the medical history on behalf of the patient. Get that to our physicians. They're also going to screen your patient and determine whether or not they're even qualified for a home sleep test or a PSG or what have you. Now, I will tell you one thing, and I've been saying this since I started in sleep testing five years ago. I don't care who the patient is. If you have some form of diagnosis of sleep-related breathing disorder, that information needs to be shared with that patient's primary care physician. So get that to them right away. Share on the risk and say the – actually, I learned this from Ken years ago. Share the risk and liability with regards to all the other comorbidities that you're not physically treating as a dentist. Not only to protect yourself, but also do what's best for the patient. Anybody agree, disagree? I'm done? I agree. Agree. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So so we're all of like minds that, you know, no one is trying to cut anyone out of the equation. We've all advocated cohesively um, networking with our medical peers. And uh, so that's where we, we all come together. Here's a great comment. Uh, isn't it still necessary for the dentist to do an evaluation, to determine TMJ and periodontal health? Absolutely. And that's why I advocate you have to see the patient in your practice and you have to do a comprehensive exam that would include TMD, everything. TMD, perio, that means full-blown charting, not PSR. So you have to see the patient. Um, to determine whether they are going to be able to accept uh, treatment and care. Um, how Tucker, I have a question. Yes, sir. 
may I ask you about that, sir? So let's yes, think about our current current situation right now. I yep. know you have. Uh, I respect your opinion, your ethics. You do everything by the books. Um, we we've got a situation right now where people need therapy potentially immediately, mm-hmm. and I think there's maybe two options here. We get, screen the patient, we get them tested, telemedicine visits happen. Are you looking at loading your opportunity so when you get back in your office, maybe May 1st, June 1st, that you have patients to take impressions on? But I know that some other dentists are using temporary appliances as well in the meantime or potentially work with Pristine and get a PAP delivered. Um, right. So I know you made a comment about it earlier, but is that your approach? You want to load your opportunity so, so, for the future? So. Ryan, I think that, you know, everybody has to make a decision of what's going to work in their practice. For me personally, and as I've always said, opinion, 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 and thanks, Steve, for typing that in as, as, a, as a question. Um, I'm all for getting the patient through the initial consultation via telemedicine so that when we hopefully are open, and you said that nasty word, June 1st, I certainly hope for everyone. <laughs> I'm hoping benefit. for May, brother. Dude, I'm hoping for I, May, I, too. I, 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 you know what? Um, I think everybody will, my word for 2020 is twitchy. And I think everyone will be a little bit more twitchy than they are if we have to go to June 1st. But whatever's best for uh, all of us as uh, human beings in our health. That being said, I'd like to do everything, the initial consult, review their home sleep study, Um, go over everything with that, uh, how oral appliance therapy works. Remember, I always recommend or um, PAP therapy uh, that they give that another try. We certainly do not uh, condemn or bash PAP therapy in our practice. So absolutely, I feel you could do all of that prior to seeing the the patient um, as soon as you open. At that point, then you can go ahead and do your comprehensive exam, as I just alluded to, take your impressions or scans, and uh, do your bite registration, and you're ready to go. That will save me uh, a a tremendous amount of time in my practice, and that's the way I think the whole concept should be handled. Now, I know others have other opinions where they are sending out various types of provisional appliances. I think that there are some some high risk uh, for that. If you're if the patient needs to be treated uh, immediately, um, there is no harm that comes from PAP therapy. So one man's opinion, opinion, opinion is that if they absolutely need, need treatment immediately, send them, put them on PAP therapy until we get through this, and hopefully they will uh, be compliant. So thank you everyone for your, all your positive comments. Um, <laughs> this is great. I've been waiting seven years for legitimate help with non-clinical aspect of OSA therapy. Great job, guys. Thank you so much. So with that being said, and it's getting late, um, I'm- What are you talking about? Been... Not over here. No, yeah, well... it's only six o'clock. <laughs> Oh, Maybe you know I can what? sit and talk all night, but yeah, I don't know. You, you, you got to get go. fed soon. So just uh, please know, everyone, that all of us that are on this webinar tonight are here to assist you. Right, thanks to Randy and the great team at Pristine Medical Billing. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for your insight as a board-certified sleep physician. Ryan, as always, thank you for your fantastic presentation. Um, and Randy, you get the award for going the longest uh, award tonight, and that's I, I will catch up with you with that and what your whistle. <laughs> and and um, all the stuff everybody needs to know or wants to know because they're most confused with it, right? Yeah, no, exactly. great. Yeah. Thank you. And the last thing I'd, I'd like to uh, there have been questions about how do people gain access to our previous webinars that we have done from Tucker Educational Excellence. You will be sent that uh, information via an email. Please check out our website at tuckereducationalexcellence.com and you can check out our YouTube channel as well. Um, 
at Tucker Educational Excellence. So with that being said, I thank all of you once again from my heart. It's uh, been a long, arduous day for all of us. Thank you all that have hung in there with us this evening. And once again, for those that missed it, for your CE credits, please email asimon at tuckereducationalexcellence.com. AGD members, please don't forget to include your AGD number. That's it for me, ladies and gentlemen. Ryan, Randy, Dr. Singh, any final comments? Thank you, thank you for having us on. Yeah, thank you for having us. We're here for you. Oh. Th thank Same. you, everyone th that participated. And most of all, I wish you all great health physically and mentally. Be well, and we look forward to seeing you again on another one of our web webinars. Take care. All right, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.